You know, we spend uh, a lot of time talking about becoming a Christian and encouraging people and studying with people and pleading with people to put their lives in Christ. But it may be beneficial for us also to take some time to think about staying in Christ, um, not making the decision to follow Him, but leaving Him later. That is, to remain faithful through trials. And I believe Scripture gives us a lot of resource to consider this. Uh, maybe sometimes we go through great difficulties that can challenge our faith and, and tempt us to lose hope. Maybe other times uh, the things that could cause us to fall away would be more subtle. They would be sort of unseen, sinister lies that could be planted in our minds by the devil uh, that could lead to an apathy or just sort of a creeping worldliness in our lives. Uh, and that can also be a trial. So whether it's something very big and obvious that could cause us to fall away or whether it could be a, a sort of slow wasting away until we find that we've left him, uh, I want to encourage all of us who have put our lives into Christ to live our entire lives for him and to die in Christ. A great passage to consider this is Romans 8. 28 through 39. I want to read through the whole passage and then take the, the time to consider various parts of it and what's really being taught by the passage. It says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Surely this passage was given to people who would need encouragement and who would need strength, and it was given to encourage them that there is nothing that must necessarily separate them from God's love and from being in Christ. It starts with these words underlined here. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And the passage does not say that everything that happens is good. And the passage does not say that um, God has these reasons for making everything happen that happens. Sometimes people sin, and that's not God's will. Sometimes people suffer as a result of sin being in the world, and it's not God's will. And so I think we give God too much credit when we give Him credit for things that Satan has actually done. It does not say God causes all things and everything God does, um, everything that happens is God's work of good, but it says God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. There is nothing that can happen in our lives that could derail the path um, that He has set before us with a good destination. Uh, it's, it's an illustration I've heard before that really makes sense is if you think about your GPS, if you have a destination in the GPS, if you make a wrong turn, it can still reroute and take you back um, where you want to go. God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And because of this, we can find peace in knowing that there is a path forward for us, that God can take us wherever we happen to be in our lives and can continue to guide us towards that, that good result. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. He doesn't say because the trials themselves are good, but he says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Even though the trials themselves may be very difficult, may be bad things, they can still lead to this positive result of having endurance and being made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. An example of this being lived out is in Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. It says, Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. I would not say it is a uh, good thing for us to have our property stolen. But God was able to work even that for their good, to bring about a good conclusion, for they were able to, to recognize more fully the glory of their possessions in Christ when they lost their physical possessions. And so they, um, they accepted joyfully even this. So that's the first part of the passage is that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And then he adds to that, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So he links them one after another, um, like a plan that has been set into motion. You can see how this would give us comfort when things don't go as we would have planned. Because Paul is telling us, God still has a path forward for you. He didn't just call you with no intention of justifying you or justify you with no intention of bringing you to the glory of heaven. It's a path and every step of the way is laid out ahead of us for us to follow. It might make you think of Jeremiah 29.11, uh, one of the most popular verses where God says, I know the plans I have for you. Uh, we're comforted by the idea that God would have a plan for us to follow. Uh, we like the 23rd Psalm, which says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me. Um, sheep don't have their days planned out on the calendar and know all the places they're going to find their food and their water and their shelter. Um, but they trust the shepherd and they can, can live a peaceful life because he has a plan for them. You might think about Abraham who was called by God to go, and he didn't know where he was going. But he had faith in God that he would, he would follow, and eventually he would get to where God was leading him. Philippians 1, 3-6 says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every, uh, in every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul was confident that God would not just call people and then abandon them. But when he began a good work in them, that he would perfect it. That there was a way for them to continue to march forward. Ephesians 2, 8-10 through 10 says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. 
And I'm not saying that humans have no choice in the matter, um, that there's no such thing as free will. We might choose to turn away from the path that He lays out. But Scripture makes it so clear there is a way that He lays out for us. There are good works which He's prepared beforehand so that we can walk in them. There's a good work that He started and He will bring it to completion in us. Um, He has a plan for us. It's not a plan that will be untouched by pain or sin or death. As we live in this world, there will be difficulties, sort of like making the, the wrong turn on the GPS, but it is a plan that can still lead us to the conclusion that he seeks for us. Jesus said in John 14, 16 through 20, He was speaking, in this case, especially to his his apostles. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be within you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Jesus came to this earth and he established his kingdom. He established a church. But he didn't just disappear then to leave us as orphans. To say, here's a church and that's it. No, no more help for you. Um, he sent his Holy Spirit to come to continue to guide us, to walk with us. So that's the uh, continuing logic of this passage in in Romans 8. God causes all things to work together for good because there's a path before us that we can walk that leads to justification and glorification. Next, he says, what then shall we say to these things? He has stated the reality that whatever occurs in our lives, God can use it to lead us forward on a good path. Um, and he stated that, that this, this path is foreknown by God and is laid out for us and is secure for us. Then he says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? As if to say, if God wants you to succeed, what force could possibly cause you to fail? No, no one could overpower God and his desire for you to succeed. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Now, there's certainly uh, a lot of answers you could give to the question, who is against us? Who, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? I believe these are rhetorical questions meant to emphasize that God is greater than those who might be against us or who might bring a charge uh, before us. But we certainly will have difficulties and those who will stand against us. We recently, uh, in, in our Bible class, looked at Zechariah 3. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So one answer to the question, uh, who will bring a charge against God's elect, is Satan. But the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And we considered that phrase, is this not a brand plucked from the fire, and looked at similar phrases in other parts of uh, of the Bible, and concluded that the meaning of that phrase was, look, is this not something precious that God has rescued, um, that God has, has stepped in and, and rescued, and now is he just going to abandon it? Is God just going to abandon his people after he just went through the trouble of providing salvation for them? So Satan may stand at our right hand to accuse us, and we may uh, be tempted to help him out by accusing ourselves, um, by by refusing to to move beyond the guilt and shame uh, that we might feel or the cynicism 
um, that we might feel our hopelessness as Satan is standing there to accuse us, to try and make us lose hope. But the Lord rebukes him, for the Lord says, This is a brand that I've plucked from the fire. This is a people for whom I have a plan. Probably several months ago, we examined Micah 7, 8 through 9. and says, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light, and I will see his righteousness. So, in this case, I don't think that Micah was referring chiefly to Satan, but he was referring to physical enemies that he had. But he said to them, Do not rejoice over me, because though I fall, I will rise. God has a plan. There's an extended story here, really, to get the whole picture. And it's, it's very entertaining and very thought-provoking of a story. To get the whole picture, you would read Numbers 22 and 23 and 24. But here are a few excerpts from that account in which Balak is an enemy of Israel. And he's trying to hire Balaam to curse Israel. And three times he tries again to get Balak to curse Israel. Israel, but each time Balaam ends up blessing Israel. So here are some excerpts from that. Numbers 23, 11 says, Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? So he tries again, and then in 23, verse 25, Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, and do not bless them at all. But Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you all that the Lord says that I must do? And <coughs> Balak tries again. You'd think he would, would stop asking Balaam to curse Israel, but he keeps asking, and, uh, and Balaam keeps blessing Israel. So again in 24, verse 10, And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've blessed them these three times. Therefore, now flee to your own place. I said, I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord, to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. So here's an instance of someone trying to bring a curse against God's people. As Romans 8 would suggest, who can bring a charge against them? Who can be their enemy? But every time he tries to curse God's people, they instead end up being blessed. I believe that's what Romans is saying that God can do for us. He can cause all things to work together for good in our lives. Satan may try again and again to curse us, but God instead can bless us. You could think also of Genesis 50, uh, verse 20, when Joseph is speaking to his brothers who, um, who sold him into slavery in Egypt and all the other things that ended up happening to Joseph. And he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So that's the, the next point portion of of Romans 8. If God is for us, who is against us? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Next, it's asked, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we're being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Most of these words are pretty straightforward uh, and easy to understand. And most of these words um, are not things that are going to occur to us, at least in the short term, um, in terms of of people driving us out of our homes or seeking to kill us to to take our property. Um, There's a good deal of economic security in our country and at least a sense of physical security from enemies. Who's to say when that might change? But for the most part, 
we tend to be pretty comfortable and pretty secure in those ways. So I would like to warn us not only against these things of tribulation and distress and persecution, but also against maybe those more subtle ways in which Satan would seek perhaps in our time to cause us to fall away. There's a principle I think is valuable here in Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. It says, Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not, may not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. So the principle here in this proverb is the idea that a person could be in such terrible distress that they would profane the name of the Lord, that they would curse Him, that they would walk away from Him or lose their, their faith in Him. But a person can also find themselves in such a comfortable place or a, a place without any real urgency so that they forget about Him, that they say, who is the Lord, or that they just um, they, they become complacent or apathetic. And for many of us, that may be the greater risk. Um, maybe we can be strong in times of great difficulty. But what about in times of relative calm? Um, then would be, we'd be tempted to forget about him. This was a warning against Israel as well. In, in Deuteronomy 8, beginning in verse 11, God said to them, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who, fled, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. You know, his description of all the things that they did go through that they need to remember um, were times that might draw, draw you to the Lord, you know, and he's talking about the terrifying wilderness of being led out of the house of slavery and going through a terrifying wilderness with serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground. But it's going to be another unique kind of challenge when they have eaten and are full and have good houses to live in and, and have all of these herds and flocks. And I think today maybe we're tempted to forget the Lord even when we are experiencing difficulties and wants because we still believe in our own might or the might of those around us to deliver us instead of God. Um, we live in a world where we have so much hope in science. We have so much hope in medicine to be able to make us comfortable, to be able to to alleviate our pains and make life, life better for us. Maybe we rely on science and medicine uh, and our own ingenuity and our own way of figuring things out and we forget about God even in our difficulties because we live in uh, a wealthy nation. So there are the things laid out here in, in Romans 8. Um, and we must be watchful in really difficult times and in really calm and easy times to remember the Lord and to rely on Him. The passage ends by saying, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor this things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, a lot of different people talk about the security of the believer. Uh, and that phrase could mean different things to different people. 
Uh, this, this passage is meant to give us a sense of security in that he's laying out every possible category of things that could draw us away from God and then telling us none of these things have the power to separate you from the love of God. In other words, if you're here this morning and your life is in Christ, it never has to leave Christ. You never have to leave Christ, and you can know that. Um, You may have the opportunity to choose to do so, but you don't have to, and we can all know that. It's like Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8, and this is the last verse that I will share this morning. It says, Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. And he's done that for all of us. Isn't that a beautiful thing to know? If our souls are at stake, and if there is a war that is going on, a spiritual warfare, and if we're going to encounter all kinds of trials, isn't it comforting to know? Like Scripture says, He'll never give us temptation without some way out. Um, Or to have it put here for us, there's an open door before us which no one can shut. You may choose not to walk through it, but no one can shut it. It's there for you to walk through. I hope that no one here chooses to walk away from the Lord or, or who, that no one here just drifts away casually and never chooses to come back because we all have the opportunity to stay in Him. Nothing can separate us if we will stay in Him. So if, if we can help you in any way, if you'd like to place your life in Christ this morning, or if you need encouragement to stay or to come back to Him, if we can help you in any way, you can come as we stand and sing together this morning. Give him all.